Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, along with those of you viewing on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech and afterwards I will ask as many questions as time permits. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we have as much time as possible for questions. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause, it may be from the guests and the members of the general public who attend our lunches and not necessarily from the working press. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly while their names are called. From your right, Peter Hickman of the National Press Club Newsmakers Committee and the man most responsible for uh, bringing our guests here today. April Ryan, White House correspondent for Urban Radio Network. Michelle Bernard, a new NPC member who writes political commentaries for PBS, CNN, The O'Reilly Factor, and MSNBC. Helen Thomas, White House correspondent for Hearst Newspapers, who last week received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Washington Press Club Foundation. Senior Senator Frederick, Frederick Chiru, a guest of the speaker. Frederick Douglass IV, a new NPC member who is the editor and publisher of the website and blog www.frederickdouglassiv.org. Tokpa J. Molba, Deputy Speaker of the Liberian House of Representatives and a guest of the speaker. Melissa Charbonneau, Vice Chair of the uh, NPC Speakers Committee. Skipping over our guest for just one moment, Myron Belkind, uh, the member of the Speakers Committee who organized today's lunch. His Excellency Charles A. Minor uh, of the Republic of Libya, the Ambassador to the United States. Liberia, Liberia. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Liberia. My apologies. Eleanor Cliff, contributing editor to Newsweek. Mary Lou Forbes, editor of the commentary section of the Washington Times. O Osita Iruebu, legal reporter for Legal Times and the 2002 Dennis Feldman Fellowship winner. And Arshad Mahmoud, a member of our International Correspondence Committee and a correspondent for the Daily Prothom Alo of Dhaka, Bangladesh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome Africa's first elected female head of state, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, to the National Press Club. Thirteen months ago today, Johnson Sirleaf entered office vowing to rebuild her country. Founded by freed American and Caribbean slaves, Liberia was considered the jewel of West Africa in the 1970s. But then ethnic rivalries and the pursuit of plunder plunged the nation into a 14-year civil war. At least 200,000 people died. By the time the war ended in 2003, Liberia had no national electrical grid, no national telephone network, and very little running water. Rich in diamonds, timber, and other natural resources, Liberia is now rated 206 out of 208 in a World Bank ranking of income per person. Amid all those troubles in November of 2005, the people of Liberia faced a choice. They could elect the Harvard-educated Ellen Johnson Sirleaf a former UN Development Administrator and a one-time Liberian Finance Minister who had been imprisoned and exiled under earlier governments. Or they could choose George Weah, a high school dropout and the nation's most famous athlete. Nicknamed the Iron Lady, Johnson Sirley took her case to the people with this slogan, this is not the time to come and learn on the job. This is the time to come and do it, the time to perform and achieve. She won that election with 59% of the vote. Now Johnson Sirleaf likes to compare her job to that of former South African President Nelson Mandela. 
She, like Mandela, must work to bring about reconciliation in a long divided country. And according to the Christian Science Monitor, this is how she reached out to supporters of the soccer star that she defeated. After attending church in a gold robe and headdress, she went to a local soccer stadium and donned sneakers and a baseball cap. Showing off the moves that she learned as an eight-year-old girl on an all-boys team, she dribbled the soccer ball across the field. Now this week in Washington, she's had to use all of her prowess, not as a soccer player, but as a diplomat, to try to persuade the United States and other donor nations to cancel Liberia's massive overseas debt. She quickly picked up the support of Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who announced that the United States plans to cancel $391 million in borrowing. The Liberian, the Liberian president responded by saying, Liberia today is at one of those key moments. We are not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot, but we are convinced that Liberia can be a success story. Ladies and gentlemen, here to tell us about her progress so far and her hopes for the future, Her Excellency President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me say thank you for that great uh, introduction and letting people know who I am. Good afternoon to all of you. I want to thank you for being here today. It's been a big week for our country, Liberia. We think overall it's been a very successful one. We had a very productive meeting with President Bush on Wednesday. And during the course of the week, we met with Secretary Rice, Secretary Paulson, Speaker Pelosi, and several distinguished leaders in the US Congress. The cornerstone of our week's work was our two days partners forum on Tuesday and Wednesday, where we met with Secretary Rice the President of the World Bank and the African Development Bank, the Managing Director of the IMF, the Commissioner of the European Commission, delegates from the United Nations, and dozens of our partner countries around the world. Yesterday, we had a very productive conference with a large number of private firms that are interested in investing and doing business in our country. Members of my team continue to do their work in meetings here in Washington and concurrent meetings on education, which are now being held in New York, sponsored by UNICEF. Our reception has been heartening. At every meeting, we received strong endorsement for our approach and powerful statements of support going forward. It means a great deal to the people of Liberia to have so many of our friends in the international community standing with us shoulder to shoulder as we face the challenges of rebuilding our country. Let me highlight for you four key areas where I think we've made significant progress this week. Strong endorsement of our progress and strategies going forward, new financial commitments, clear progress on debt relief, and new commitments to support private investment. First, our most important objective was to obtain an endorsement for our approach so far and our strategies going forward. We succeeded. The message was loud and clear. Our partners were clearly impressed 
by the progress we have made so far and were energetically supportive of our plans for the future. They understand the enormous challenges which we face. As most of you know, Liberia was nearly destroyed by its civil war. Liberians saw their communities destroyed and their families uprooted. When we took office, there was no electricity and no water. Schools and clinics had crumbled and roads were impassable. Institutions of governance had completely collapsed and corruption was rampant. Many youths had spent more time in war than in school. Average incomes had fallen 80%. Exports had collapsed. Over three quarters of our people lived below the poverty line of $1 per day. The elections of 2005 were a watershed event in our history when Liberians shouted and clearly said that they wanted an end to the suffering. They wanted to come together to build a new Liberia. We set ourselves on a course of building a nation that is peaceful, secure, and prosperous with democratic and accountable governance based on the rule of law. We set out to establish a sound economy with robust job growth and a vibrant private sector fully integrated into the global economy that gives all Liberians the basic economic opportunities they need to provide for their families. We built our strategy on four basic pillars, enhancing peace and security, revitalizing the economy, strengthening governance and the rule of law, and rehabilitating infrastructure and delivering basic services. As we recounted to our partners, we have made significant progress in each of these areas. To further enhance peace and security, we have completed the deactivation of 17,000 members of our former security service and initiated recruitment for new security forces. We have placed 75,000 ex-combatants in reintegration programs and put 36,000 in formal three-year education programs well over 100,000 internally displaced people and refugees have returned home and into their villages over the past year. We are proud that they have decided that it's finally time for them to come home. To rebuild our economy and revitalize it, we, starting by, we started by putting our financial house in order. We balanced our budget within four months and increased government revenue by 48%. We have completed an, the review of 95 contracts and concession agreements, initiated renegotiation for those which have potential for mutual benefits. We passed a new Forestry Reform Act that paved the way for the lifting of UN sanctions on our timber sector. We reached agreement with the ArcelorMittal Steel for an iron ore concession agreement that will provide investment of over $1 billion over a seven year period. Similar negotiations with our longstanding partner Firestone have started this week. To jump, to jump start our agricultural sector we reactivated the Central Agricultural Research Institute and distributed over 40,000 tools and 20 metric tons of seed rice to some 33,000 farmers throughout the country. We are pleased that at the forum, the United Nations announced that they would provide us with the assistance that we need 
to get even more seeds so that our farmers will be able to start the planting season within the next two months to be able to provide most of our staples. As a result of all these efforts, our economy grew at 8% last year, providing the basis for our recovery effort. To strengthen our systems of governance and the rule of law, we have begun to decentralize decision making and allocate appropriate resources to local governance. We began the difficult process of civil service reform, starting by removing a large number of course workers from the payroll and facilitating the retirement of many long-term tenured civil servants. We are determined to fight corruption, which has eaten away at the fabric of our nationhood and society. We have developed and begun to implement a strong anti-corruption policy and strategy. In addition to fighting tax fraud and renego renegotiating concession agreements, we introduce a requirement that all of us, myself included, and all cabinet members and officials, all commission officers will publicly declare their assets. And we have submitted a code of conduct to our legislature that will ensure that this is subjected to judicial action. To begin to rebuild our infrastructure and deliver basic services, we have made initial important progress on building roads, bridges, schools, and clinics. One of the proudest moments of this past year was when we were able to turn lights on and turn water on in our capital city for the first time in 15 years. Our children danced in the streets. Some who only knew that water came out of a bucket realized that it could come out of a tap. Today, many of them, without lights in their homes, do their homework sitting on the sidewalk under the street lights. We were able to increase school enrollment by 40% and provided school furniture throughout the country. With the help of our partners, we have restored services to over 350 health facilities across the country and rehabilitated more than 20 clinics and several hospitals and health clinics, including the John F. Kennedy Referral Hospital in our capital city. Our recent measles vaccination campaign reached 97% of children under five year old. And to fight the scourge of malaria, one of the leading killers in our country, we have distributed 125,000 mosquito nets and trained over 3,500 health workers in malaria case management. We were very pleased that President Bush included Liberia in the measles initiative which was the subject of the summit last December. And we expect that through that facility, we will be able to do even more to fight this killer disease. These are just some of the things we have accomplished during our first year. We think we are off to a good start, and our partners gave us a ringing endorsement of our progress. They have also expressed strong support for our plans and strategies going forward. Specifically, there was clear satisfaction with our interim poverty reduction strategy, which our partners agreed went well beyond the norm for countries in our circumstances. We are gratified that both the Liberian people and the international community are so supportive of our approach to tackle our problems. Our second major accomplishment this week was to receive significant new financial commitments. The forum was not a pledging conference per se, 
and we did not set this as one of our objectives to obtain this, a particular level of support. Nevertheless, we were gratified by the statement of new and continued financial support. We have not yet added up all the commitments as they come in different forms and over different time periods. So summing it up to a single number will take us some time. But we note in particular new commitments from the United States of around $100 million a year and a commitment from the U.S. also to continue to support our security program, security sector reform program, to ensure that our training targets are met on time. We also receive commitments, new commitments from the World Bank, which already has some 80 million ongoing, of 35 additional million each year. An exceptional one from the World Bank as we are heavily indebted to them. And this represents grants before we have the pre-clearance of our arrears. We also got from the Euro European Commission which already has over 100 million in commitments, at least 30 millions a year new money going forward. And we're glad to see that some of the countries in which our bilateral relationship had over time been discontinued except for support for our peacekeeping and our humanitarian effort have now come back on board. And during these meetings, Ireland committed 20 million a year, 19 from the United Kingdom, 16 million from Sweden per year. We are grateful to all of them for this show of support. We also receive commitments from the private sector. Ed Scott, the chairman of the board for the Center for Global Development, pledged a gift of one million to provide support for young professionals who would come to work in our ministries. The Liberian Education Trust which is supported by the Open Society Initiative has already raised some $3 million to be able to support the training of girls' education and the support for teacher training and the rehabilitation of schools. These funds, in addition to an estimated aggregate $400 million for, for programs that are now ongoing, will enable us to enhance our development effort. Third, the more important for us is the significant progress on debt relief, one of the areas where we came here to tackle. As many of you know, our debt burden is huge, amounting to $3.7 billion, much of it representing a tripling of the principal because of accrued interest since the debt had not been serviced over two decades. Our three largest bilateral creditors, the United States, Germany, and the United Kingdom, all announced that they would forgive 100% of the bilateral debt. <laughs> In the context of the HIPIC process, we're particularly grateful to Secretary Rice for taking the strong leadership in this regard by making the first announcement that brought the others on board. And we expect that still others would follow in the coming weeks. These debts alone amount to over $700 million. In terms of the multilateral debt relief, the US and several other countries expressed their commitment to work with the legislatures, with your Congress, to ensure that significant funds held at the IMF can be used to clear Liberia's arrears to the IMF. In the case of the US alone, this could amount to more than $150 million. The same with the African Development Bank, where the US has already pledged to work with other shareholders to ensure that their debt is fully canceled. Fourth, at the private sector conference, sponsored by the Corporate Council on Africa, OPEC, and the International Finance Corporation, 
we were gratified to receive several new commitments to support our private sector. Robert Johnson of, of I think BET, Black Entertainment Television, followed up on his commitment last year at the Clinton Global Initiative and announced the formation of a $30 million fund to invest in Liberian entrepreneurs. We signed a feasibility study with the U.S. Trade and Development Authority for our hydro electric facility that was damaged during the years. We signed an open skies agreement with the U.S., replacing one that had been signed in the 1960s that eventually will open the way once we have completed the rehabilitation of our airports for direct flights from the United States to Liberia. We signed a new trade and investment framework. The conference was oversubscribed with 400 participants. We sent a good signal to our people. It's been a busy week, but a productive one. It is important for all of us to remember that in the end, we are not here for numbers or sign agreements or commitment of support. We are here to help the people of Liberia to put the past behind them, to rebuild their families and their communities, to become independent and responsible members of the international community. We still have a long way to go, but we are grateful for all the support we have received this week toward achieving these goals. Our country, Liberia, it's not a poor country, just a country that has been poorly managed. With our resources, we have said emphatically that we can move from economic free fall to a good economic performer. We can move from dependency to self-sufficiency. We can move from aid to trade. And in all of this, the greatest satisfaction that I get and that many of us share is the hope and promise that has returned to our people. We have made our children smile again and there's no substitute for that in all that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for questions. All right. And we have a great deal of questions here. Now, since your election, Liberia seems to be an island of tranquility in a part of the world where there is a lot of trouble these days. How can that be explained? How can that be sustained? Only because Liberia has begun the process of responding to the needs of our people to give them the confidence in the future. But our peace is fragile. It is dependent right now upon a United Nations peacekeeping force, which is still 13,000 persons strong. And it will depend on our ability to train our own security forces to take on this responsibility. When the pressure comes, as we expect very soon, as we make progress for the peacekeeping force to leave. We have problems in our subregion, but we continue to work with the African leadership to ensure that those problems are resolved so that our country does not slip back into conflict and some of our neighboring countries can find the way to peace as we have done. Following up on that, if you could talk a little bit about the stability in the rural areas and about uh, how advanced are the uh, determinations on the issue of new forestry and mining concessions. What's the last part? New um, uh, the, the determination? The, the, yeah, oh. how solid are the uh, new concessions on uh, forestry and mining? Again, in the rural areas, we're finding the same uh, type of uh, slow stability return. The UN peacekeeping forces are deployed all over the country. They provide assistance. 
Increasingly, as our own security forces are trained, we try to deploy them so that they can take on these responsibilities. But we say that the biggest response to security issues is to respond to the needs of the people, to fight poverty, to give them jobs, to send their children to school, to make sure that they can go back on their farms and produce for themselves. And that's where we've put our emphasis on the development. As the human security will safeguard the other kinds of security that we get through arms. Many skilled and educated Liberians left the country during the presidency of Charles Taylor. What would you say to those who've left the country? Uh, what, what would you say to them about coming back? We've encouraged all of our citizens to come back home. We need their skills, we need their talents, we need their contribution. We also understand the situation that they face. Many of them have been in this and other countries for more than two decades. Many of their children were born here or born in other countries where they are citizens of this country. Many of them have contributed to the peace and the development we've experienced so far through huge amounts of remittances to their families and to their friends and associates. We'd like to see them come. We could not absorb them all. If all of a sudden 200,000 Liberians descended on us, we wouldn't know what to do in terms of jobs and housing and, and all the things to which they're entitled. But we do want to see them as they've started to trickle back on a voluntary basis. We hope that this country will allow them refuge as they try to, to make this decision and to make this transfer in a very orderly way, consistent with our ability to absorb them. But it is home and they're all welcome to come home and join in the process of national renewal. How can Liberian progressiveness spread throughout Africa? I hope we've started with my elections. <laughs> uh, but also what we'd like to see, Liberia is a, well, it is a small country. A uh, population at more than 3.3 million, very richly endowed. Our progress as a post-conflict country, which we think will make Liberia a success story, we think will be infectious. And we think we could spread that message to many other countries that have faced conflict. We try to follow the examples of many that have already made successes, like Mozambique and Rwanda. Uh, and we look forward to DRC being in the, in the same situation with us. I see the ambassador right there. We hope that uh, Liberia and DRC can become the next group to become a success story after conflict and that this in itself will send a message to all. And I hope that the experience of our self-destruction will also send a clear message to people that it's so easy to destroy and so difficult to rebuild. Members of some international development agencies believe that providing technical support is better suited for post-conflict nations than direct budgetary support. What do you believe is best for Liberia? We need a bit of both. I mean, we need technical assistance to begin because we recognize that we have a capacity problem given the fact that all our talents and skills left the country over the years of conflict. And many may know that we, we already adopted what is called the Governing Economics Management Assistance Program, GMAP, uh, which brings into the country experts uh, that have even co-signing authorities in many of our revenue generating agencies. We welcome that because of the technical skills it brings. Uh, but ultimately, we have to build our own capacity. We have to take primary responsibility. Uh, for our development. And so during the course of these two days, we said to partners, we know you needed to get the confidence in us that we would have the integrity, we would have the systems of, of um, accountability and transparency. But with this one year, if we've started to get that confidence restored and if we can build upon that, we then would like to see technical assistance begin to diminish and our own people take full responsibility for the management of our resources. Could you elaborate a bit on the U.S. debt forgiveness and what it will mean to the economy of your country? This is a very, very important um, element of what we can do to achieve our development goals. 
the U.S. is not only doing the bilateral debt, even though it's not being serviced, but until we can clear all of those, it means we do not have access to long-term development financing, which would be provided under IDA, under IDA and other facilities. By clearing this debt, it means that we can now, instead of getting, say, from the World Bank 80 million, we could probably get 200 million if we were as accessing their soft window on the IDA. And so this is very important to us, and the fact that the U.S. has taken the leadership in this regard sends a signal to all the other countries that have been a little bit uh, slow and reluctant to do something that Liberia now has earned with its performance over the last year with a staff monitoring program that was successfully completed with the IMF, that uh, the removal of that debt removes a major constraint for us to be able to ramp up our development effort and achieve our development goals. What more can the U.S. do to help Liberia get back on its feet beyond debt relief? Private investment, private investment. We'd like to see our private sector take off. The government could not even continue with new loans, even if we, we were in a position to do so, because we don't want to see a buildup of debt once again. And so we want to see private investors. You mentioned about concessions and contracts. We, we will be looking at those that did not reach the national interest test. We will renegotiate them. Our con we'll be giving it out on a bidding process under new laws, and we hope the private sector will you know, will take uh, the major part of this effort. Uh, that's the best thing we can do, and we, we hope that uh, the message we sent in our private sector session the other day, uh, and the, the telling them about the potential we have, you know, the minerals we have, and the marine resources, and the forestry resources, and the agricultural resources, that we will attract the private capital and investment in partnership with us. Uh, so, so far, how have your efforts to lure private investment into the country paid off? It's starting to pay off. Uh, at first, they have, there had to be some reluctance. They wanted to make sure this government was serious, serious about development, serious about integrity, serious about, about uh, moving the country forward, responding to the needs of the people. So we were not... Uh, Disappointed that in the first year there wasn't a great rush of everybody, but now the rush is on. Uh, I think they have seen in this one year how determined we are to do the right thing, uh, to make the right decisions, to get our economy back. And uh, our completion of the renegotiations with Metal Steel, that's the largest steel company uh, in the world, that already had an agreement with us, but we thought it didn't meet our national interest test. And we brought them back to the negotiating table, and. Uh, we renegotiated provisions that resulted in better benefits to our country, and they accepted that. We've now concluded that process. The ratification of that concession agreement is before our legislature, and that has sent a powerful signal to all that Liberia is not only back, but back in business. What initiatives are being developed to encourage tourism? Tough one, given the state of our infrastructure. <laughs> uh, the roads, the hotels, the lights, the water, all of those things that tourists will require for their comfort are not there yet. Uh, we need time to, to, to do that, and that's part of our agenda. We do have some great tourist spots, you know, lakes that you can wade in, falls and mountains to climb. Uh, to get to them, you, you probably have to go over some rough roads, and I'm not sure everybody's ready for, ready for that or, <laughs> or, or sleep, sleep with a lantern in the night. I'm not sure you're ready for, ready for that either. But we hope in a year we will have put a lot of our infrastructure back in place and then we can concentrate on uh, tourism. Now that Monrovia and its surroundings have electricity, uh, how long do you anticipate uh, electricity to be spread to other parts of the nation? Uh, let, let me first say that not all of Monrovia has electricity. <laughs> uh, we, we turn on some street lights, we put lights in some of the hospitals, a few offices and a few institutions at a very high cost. 
because it's thermal generation. And, uh, and when the price of um, petroleum, when the price of oil goes up, uh, we feel it. And we're getting the support for those operating costs through our partners too, the United States, uh, the European Commission, uh, the World Bank. And so uh, we, we're, wanted, we're going into our second phase of the emergency power that will expand power to more people. Uh, what we're doing is to, to look at what we can do about rural electrification, see if we can use alternative sources of energy. And we've got a few suggestions and proposals on the table for biomass. Uh, we want to look at uh, hydro on some of our streams, mini hydros that can supply some of our rural areas. Uh, it's an area that requires a lot of money, money which our budget cannot afford. And unless we can attract uh, the support, we hope that the study we sign um, this week with the U.S. to, to, to get the feasibility uh, study for our hydro will help us. It'll take us a while. It'll take us a few years before we'll be able to get electricity all over the country. Has the crisis in Darfur diverted much needed humanitarian aid from Liberia to that region? Um, as yet, it's not affected us. Um, you know, there have been other pockets for Darfur and uh, Darfur itself has not openly welcomed uh, a lot of aid as, as it should be. Um, so far it's not affecting us, I, other than the sentiments we have when we see our own African brothers and sisters suffering. Um, if uh, the situation there continues to, to worsen, uh, it may make a difference. And perhaps in one way, in one way, yes, it would because as we progress, humanitarian aid from many of the non-governmental organizations uh, no longer fit their policies, and many of them in our health sector are already saying that uh, we're now progressing, we can take over our responsibility, and they must move on to the next humanitarian crisis, which, which could likely be done for. Uh, and so in that way, yes, it could begin to affect, to affect us very soon if those humanitarian agencies begin to move out. There has been increased Chinese investment in, in Africa. Uh, the Chinese have also been uh, offering uh, loans to African countries. Uh, what are you, your views on Chinese engagement with Africa, and there, should there be concern about increased debt as a re result of this Chinese activity? Uh, uh, yes, I think everybody ought to be concerned if, um, if Chinese engagement in Africa results in a debt burden of countries. We've not reached that stage because we still have a lot of debt. We couldn't take on new debt uh, until we've cleared our debt in keeping with our uh, HIPAA arrangement. Uh, what the Chinese are doing with us is mainly grants and they're, they're doing small things. And I must say that in one case, uh, China and the U.S. are working cooperatively. They're both working to, to get our university uh, moved to their new campus. Uh, and so we, we just see them as another. I think the basic thing will be each country has to make sure that they're fully in charge of their development agenda, that they set, they set the tone, they set the policies, they ensure what they want um, China to do and what they will allow and not allow. And if a government is in full control of its own development agenda, then they will, they will examine and, and restrict and dictate the means whereby their partners uh, take, take share. Um, let me just remind many people who think there's a competition uh, for a small country like Liberia that um, China has major investment in the United States and the United States has major investment in China. <laughs> you talked about your efforts to uh, tackle the corruption issue in Liberia. I was wondering if you could talk about whether what you're doing is something other nations uh, can learn from. Uh, we hope so. Um, particularly as a post-conflict country, uh, the steps we've taken to be very clear in our division, uh, in our vision, uh, to set our agenda, the, um, the major steps we've taken in our reform agenda, um, things like fighting corruption, uh, are things that we, we believe can, can set an example and, and you know, can establish uh, 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 some standards by which uh, other countries might, might look at this and see if it suits their situation. 
Uh, we hope that if we, ex if we succeed to, to quickly uh, move, move ourselves along, that this in itself uh, will, will stand out f for many countries that are still in conflict and, and need good examples uh, to, to follow. In your opinion, what is the future of former Liberian President Charles Taylor? Well, the, the international community uh, is handling this one. Uh, Mr. Taylor is expected to, to go to trial. Uh, we expect that he will be given the right of self-defense and that the rule of law will apply to him, that, that uh, he, you know, he will go through proper due process and, and, and then we'll see what, what comes of that. Uh, for Liberia, uh, we just say that uh, three million people more important than one person, and our people wanted to put the past behind them and move on to embrace a new future. Has Nigeria's providing sanctuary to Taylor strained the relationship between Liberia and Nigeria? No, not at all. We have a very strong relationship with Nigeria. President Obasanjo and I are good friends. We talk all the time. I think uh, he too would like to put that behind him. There is a cloud of enthusiasm back in Liberia as a result of the developments from Washington, but at the same time there is a gloomy development, the resignation of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. What is your response to this news? I wish I were brave enough to ask the Deputy Speaker to take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, like, like, every, like everything else, um, we, we think that's one of those little blips, you know, on a country in transition. Uh, don't expect it to be easy for us. You know, we're coming from two decades of lawlessness and indiscipline and disunity and disharmony and, and all the things that characterize the, the, what we represented. And so we expect that there will be lots of problems. We expect there will be dissent. We expect there will be, you know, fallouts and, and, and small pockets of conflict. Uh, for us, it's a necessary part of this transition, a transition that involves a deep-rooted change uh, of fighting vested interests that have been entrenched for decades. And so this is just one of those things. Even that shall pass away. What is the state of relations between former um, American slaves and native Liberians, and what is being done to encourage product productive relations between them? We try not to use those words anymore. <laughs> we want increasingly for Liberians to be Liberians, no matter what your background, uh, no matter what your uh, descendants and And Americans are Americans. Uh, there is a historical linkage. We think that there's a lot that can be done to use that, that linkage, you know, for the benefit of, of um, our, our people. And, and certainly efforts have been made in that regard. We share common values, we share uh, a common culture, uh, a common history way back, but uh, Liberia is an African nation. The Liberian people are Africans and that's where they belong and the few that may have come, um, that was a long time ago. All of our children are are born Liberians and born Africans and very proud of being that. And I think the African-American community may also be proud of their heritage and their roots, but they're Americans, just like any one of you. As the first woman president of an African nation, how will you approach some of the issues affecting females in your country as well as the entire continent? Well, for one thing, we want to see more females in important positions, and I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, in our country and in my administration, we've got them in all the strategic roles. Uh, women head the finance ministry, the commerce ministry, the justice ministry, the youth and sports ministry, <laughs> the uh, 
gender ministry, and more importantly, for the first time in our history, a woman is head of our police. <laughs> There will be even more, so, but there are other things we can do. The, the women that we're very concerned about is our women in the informal sector. Those women that stay in the markets all day with their children working, they're my greatest constituency. They voted for me. And my obligation to them is to improve their working conditions. And we've started to do that, and we want to see them move up not to be petty traders and, and market, small marketeers all their lives, but to see if we can set them on a place where they can get into business and they can become you know, strong entrepreneurs, some of them. Uh, and that's what we'll be working on. We hope that this facility that's come from Bob Johnson will, will help us to support some of them to move up to the next layer in their business activity. How well are you accepted by your male African counterparts, given the fact that uh, subjugation of women is still widespread in parts of the continent? I've earned my stripes. <laughs> <laughs> I've done everything they've done and more. What I... <laughs> whether it's going to prison, whether it's being exiled, whether it's waiting to be a professional both at home and abroad. I hope I'm correct in saying that they, they respect me for what I am and what I've done and what I stand for. And with that respect comes cooperation. What is the biggest challenge that you face as a woman president? Meeting the expectations and aspirations of women in Liberia, Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I am, after all, on a microscope. And whatever I do will make a difference in whether women can move on to that next layer and open this glass cage even, even wider and whether they can claim, as they are all over the place, uh, claim leadership in all spheres of of society, but uh, it, places, um, it places a huge burden on me and makes me humble. Uh, I, so I have to succeed on their behalf, and, and that, that, uh, that is always mindful. I'm always mindful of that. It's always hanging, you cannot fail. You've got to succeed, not just for you, but for all those women out there who are counting on me. That's my greatest challenge. <laughs> What do you think of the school that Oprah Winfrey has opened in Africa? Do you think it is a significant investment in girls' education? Yes, I think so. I think it was a great um, gesture, great action on the part of Oprah to, to select an African country and to open a school for girls that would train thousands of these young girls in their profession. Um, there's great uh, humanitarian response on her part. And we just hope that uh, when South Africa is often clicking, that she'll take a look west. <laughs> <laughs> uh, following up on that, what is the biggest challenge today in educating Liberian girls? Just getting them to stay in school. Uh, you know, young girls are not giving preference if there's no income with the family and they have to educate some of their children. Uh, traditionally, boys get, you know, get the preference. And that's why we have this special program for girls' education to be able to give them the scholarships. And the response on that is, is, is coming. Um, making sure that, and I tell you a big problem, making sure that our young girls are not subjected to rape. Uh, that could take them away from their educational goals and, and, and make them mothers too soon uh, and thereby interrupt their schooling. Uh, we've got a tough rape law, but getting it implemented in a male-dominated judicial system uh, is, is always a big problem. And so that, that's the challenge, to, to keep them in school and to have them reach their potential through education. So. Can you please speak about the state of the Liberian ship registry and your thoughts on the way it's being run? Um, the registry is run through an agency that's based here um, in this general area. 
uh, we have some oversight responsibility. We think not enough. Uh, we believe, we think that um, the revenue that has accrued to the country over the past year does not reflect uh, equity uh, in those benefits, and we've made that very clear. Uh, it's a useful service to us. The agency is very competent. The agency has made sure that um, Liberian registered vehicles do meet all the international standards and we're very pleased about that. Um, but we are going to renegotiate because uh, the country needs to get uh, more of those resources that they generate, and, and that's our aim, and we're gonna get that, we think. What do you think about the U.S. occupation of Iraq? <laughs> it's right here on the card. I <laughs> If it brings freedom, if it results in the emancipation of the people, if it involves the people in their takeover, in their managing their own future, then it might be perceived to be a good sacrifice for a great cause. Um, we don't say more than that. We don't interfere in the internal affairs of another country, but. We believe in emancipation. Our own country went through that. Okay, we're almost out of time, and I just have a couple quick announcements before I ask our last question. Um, first of all, let me remind everyone of our future speakers. On February 26th, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California, will be here with us. On the 27th, Janet Napolitano, the governor of Arizona, and on March 6th, Mark Morial, uh, the president of the National Urban League. Next, I'd like to present the gifts that we always give to our esteemed guests. Certificate. Oh, great. Terrific. Terrific. And, and the much coveted National Press Club mug. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and our last question comes from 13-year-old Amaris Green, who asks, when, were you, when you were a young girl, did you dream of becoming a president? No. <laughs> no, I didn't have such great dreams. <laughs> Not when I was a young girl. I just thought I'll be like my mother, grow up to be a teacher. But uh, life has many twists and turns, and, and when that twist comes and you find yourself on that curve that takes you a different road, then you grasp the moment and you seize the opportunity and you go for it, and that's what happened to me. Great, thank you very much, really appreciate it. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I'd also like to thank National Press Club members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch. Also thanks to the NPC Library for research. The video archive of the lunch is provided by the Press Club's Broadcast Operations Center. Press Club members can also access free transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>